All right, welcome to our next session on Big Talk from Small Libraries 2022. I am your host for the day, Krista Porter here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, it is 11 a.m. Central Time, and we have our next presenter ready to go here. Uh, Allie Stevens is director at the Calhoun County Library. Good morning, Allie. Good morning. And their population served is um, what you, what you said earlier, 5,000? Is that still? Right at 5,000. Yeah, it, with every census, it inches down a little further and a little further. <laughs> but it's at, it's at about 5,000 right now. For the whole county. Awesome. And um, she's going to talk to us about um, creating uh, supportive and inclusive libraries for um, all sorts of communities, all sizes of communities, crystal queer. So I'm just gonna hand it over to you, Allie, and um, to, to, um, um, to go ahead and get started. And we do have a link, as you mentioned earlier, to um, a Google Drive that I'm gonna share out, and it will be included. We do have the recording later as well. Um, we will include a link to um, everyone's presentations and the, um, the, the video of their um, presentation and their presentations themselves and any other documents. And she has um, a Google Drive here that has some resources that you'll be able to access as well. So go ahead and take it away, Allie. All right, good morning. Um, I don't know about you guys, but after those last two sessions, I have the urge to get up and go rearrange my entire collection. So. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <everyone. laughs> I'm hoping that passes by this afternoon because I have a lot of other stuff I really need to do. <laughs> but I really, uh, really want to reorganize. I've been wanting to, and now I have more ideas than time. Um, so Krista gave you guys a pretty good introduction to me. I'm not going to add anything to that except that for the past two years, I was the coordinator of YALSA's Best Fiction for Young Adults list, um, which gave me a good bit of insight in the publishing side of um, the books that are coming out. So I'm not actually going to get into Reader's Advisory much today, but there are some images in the folder that I shared that uh, have my recommended books in case you're looking to add to your collections. Um, before I really dive into this, I want to give some content warnings for all of you. Um, there's some information about distressing current events, child abuse, human trafficking, and mentions of suicide and self-harm in this presentation. So I want you to take care of yourselves first. And if you're not in a place where you can safely participate in this, it will not hurt my feelings if you need to step away. Um, the whole presentation is not those things but they are part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. So when I um, did this presentation initially, it was for the ARLA conference here in Arkansas. And I started with this recent legislation from last year that highlights why this issue is so important um, for all of our patrons right now. As I'm sure you're aware, the Arkansas legislature passed quite a few bills um, that affect LGBTQ young people in particular in this past year. And a lot of these are also on the table in other states. So mm -hmm. just to touch quickly on the top two, um, Act 461 here prevented um, athletes from competing in school sports with the their, their affirmed gender. They have to participate by their assigned at birth gender. Um, Eight other states have already enacted these laws, and there are 22 that had them on the table last year. Act 462, which is commonly referred to as a right of conscience law, allows any medical providers the right to not participate in non-emergency treatments that violate their conscience by going against religious or moral beliefs. It applies to doctors, hospitals, nurses, pharmacists, any insurers, and anyone involved in healthcare. So they can decide that because their conscience tells them what you're doing is wrong, they don't have to participate in your health care. Um, that state, I mean, that law was, there are 12 other states that have one like that. Um, and many others have similar laws. And then the one that was really in the news, Arkansas was the first state to enact a ban on gender affirming medical treatment for kids under 18. Mm -hmm. And that one was temp temporarily struck down. Um, but there are many other states considering similar laws. So all of this and these issues, which are in the news right now, we've all been hearing about the Texas governor who's calling for members of the public to report parents of trans kids for allowing gender affirming medical care. He's calling it child abuse. Um, mm -hmm. The Supreme Court is getting ready to hear another case about Colorado weddings. It all, it's like Colorado and the weddings in the Supreme Court for this issue, but this time it's about a website creator um, who 
doesn't want to be obligated to create websites for LGBTQ people. Um, 2021, according to Human Rights Campaign and the ACLU, was the most anti-LGBTQ legislative season in the history, in like recent history. Um, there were 147 different proposals, and in 2022, there are expected to be around 280. So it's likely to be even worse this year. So all of this leads to some direct effects on our patrons. Um, LGBTQ patrons are going to be at increased risk of crisis in terms of housing, mental health, medical health, food, at increased risk of assault, abuse, or being trafficked. They have an increased need for diverse representative collections and spaces, an increased need for competent, compassionate adult interactions, particularly the young people, um, and a need for privacy and personal empowerment. I know that there's a lot of heavy stuff going on in the news today, not just in this area, but every single aspect, it seems like. Um, I came across this tweet a couple of days ago, and it really helped me settle down into working on this presentation because I had been kind of all over the place. Um, and so the tweet says, it can be overwhelming to witness, experience, and take in all the injustices of the moment. The good news is that they're all connected. So if your little corner of work involves pulling at one of the threads, you're helping to unravel the whole damn cloth. So for the next 45 minutes, I would invite you to work on this corner and see how much of this one corner we can unravel. Okay, so mm -hmm. it's not really easy to measure the outcome of all of these laws and all these conversations on young people and LGBTQ patrons in general, but this statistic makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up every single time I look at it. 42% of LGBTQ young people seriously considered suicide in this says in the past year, this is from 2021, so in 2020. Um, and that includes more than half of transgender and non-binary youth. So just about one in two of every LGBTQ kids who comes in your library has thought about killing themselves in the last year. And if that does not belie a need for us to be compassionate, considerate, and supportive, then I don't know what does. Um, mm -hmm. So, our goal is always to find ways that we can use our library services and collections to offer things that reduce those risks and um, target those needs of our communities. So libraries are really on the front lines in this issue. Um, in Arkansas, so both of these are our Arkansas libraries, just because they're the ones that I'm familiar with, but I'm certain this is happening in all of your states. Um, in the past, let's see, last year, no, since 2018, more than half of ALA's most challenged books every year are on the basis of just simply like acknowledging the existence of LGBTQ people. Um, in the past year, Faulkner Van Buren's system, specifically the Conway Public Library and the Crackhead County Jonesboro Public Library have had issues with their programming and their materials being challenged. Um, in the case of Crackhead County Jonesboro, it's happening by a member of their own library board. Um, there is a lot of loud opposition to the inclusion of these materials in our libraries. And I think it's not unreasonable for, in, for this to come to a head or become um, you know, a, a problem at any of our libraries. But there are some things that we can do to be prepared for when it does happen. Um, and we have an obligation to serve all parts of our communities despite the possibility of these conflicts. Uh, we can be loud from a position of support too. And if we are not, then it's easy for reason and compassion to be drowned out by those who would rather LGBTQ people and allies be invisible or non-existent. Um, neutrality anywhere always benefits the status quo. And I don't know about y'all, but that's kind of antithetical to the work that I'm trying to do here in this library. So. If you have not heard uh, me or anyone speak about how to make sure you have a really strong collection development policy, you can check out the LGBTQ and you workshop that I did with Ruth Hyatt through the Arkansas State Library. The links to that are on the handout in that Google Drive folder. It's available on YouTube. Anybody can watch it. There's a really good part in there about how to make sure that your collection development policy is as strong as you can make it. Um, so that aside, 
because that is in and of itself an hour, hour and a half conversation. These are the things that we're gonna, I'm gonna go over today that we can do um, to help support our collections and our patrons and our staff members and our whole communities. Um, creating representative diverse collections that don't perpetuate harmful stereotypes and cataloging them in such a way that they are easily searchable and don't use any outdated or harmful terminology. Um, we can make sure that we have non-discrimination and anti-harassment policies, as well as inclusive identification policies. All of these are fairly simple, non-time consuming things that give us a lot of um, underpinning in a, in a policy way for the work that we're doing, which is really important uh, when challenges come or, or people attempt to censor what we're doing. Um, state privacy law, knowing your state privacy law is really gonna help. Um, human trafficking signs and what to do if you suspect that that's happening. Crisis and non-crisis, local and national resource lists. Um, evaluating our own biases. There are some tools online that are really helpful in learning to evaluate where our own biases are and what we can do about them. Learning for Justice School Climate Assessment. This used to be called Teaching Tolerance. Um, the school climate assessment is obviously most relevant for a school environment, but there's a lot of it that is still relevant in a public library situation where you're working with young people. Um, there's also safe space training. You can test your computer filters, and I'm gonna go into a little more detail about that, but a lot of uh, standard computer filters that people are required to use for E-rate are filtering out access to LGBTQ resources that are in no way inappropriate, but because of certain letter strings that may be contained, um, they get filtered out. And so you can check and make sure that, you know, those websites are getting through. Um, being prepared for materials and program challenges in a specific way um, is something else that I'll talk about. And that part is a little time consuming, but worth it if you can tell that these sorts of things are coming down the pipeline. Um, then the safe folder for yourself or your organization is one that I just added last night because it's something, it's an idea that I came across in reference to what's going on in Texas, um, where they're advising parents to create a safe folder that has a lot of documentation about the state of their family and how, um, how they have handled the health of their child. But it's a similar idea that we, I think we can adapt for libraries so that we can collect this documentation to prove that what we're doing is uh, impactful in a positive way. Okay, let's see. All right, so first a few quick tips on um, representative diverse collections. So it takes a lot of training to be able to pick out problematic content in books. I've been doing, you know, specifically evaluation of YA books for years now, and I still miss stuff all the time. Um, I read a lot of reviews that are written by real readers that are shared on sites like Goodreads and Amazon. Um, a lot of intellectual and emotional labor is going into those reviews on the part of readers, particularly when they're calling things out. That's not easy to do. It's not easy to put into words. Um, and you can learn so much from reading those opinions by people who share the marginalizations in the books that you're trying to evaluate. Uh, do not put external labels on your books that in any way identify them as LGBTQ, uh, particularly in more conservative rural areas. Some of these, some of the kids live in dangerous situations and that effectively puts those books off limits for them if they're labeled in such a way that it is very obvious what they are. Um, and you can't, you know, you can't do much about like, there's a book called The Summer of Jordi Perez that has a really cute rainbow spine label. Like the whole spine is a rainbow and you can't change that, but we don't have to add anything that makes it more obvious what these books are. Um, by the same token, don't create displays that only feature LGBTQ books. If you're doing a display for Pride Month and you want to only feature those books, create a printout. You know, get a little get the little uh, sign stands and put a picture of the book, but leave the books themselves on the shelf, because by the same token that a kid might not be able to take home a book that has a rainbow sticker on it, they might be with an adult that makes it impossible for them to walk up to a table of those books and look at them without having to have conversations that 
they're not ready for or that are unsafe. So find ways to share your collection with your patrons that don't ever put the books off limits to the readers. Um, okay, I'm, I I'm promise I'm not going to spend this whole next however long on my libraries can never be neutral soapbox, but it's a false dichotomy that we have to collect both sides of every argument equally. There are not always materials on both sides that are of equal value, and that's fine. Our job is to select good, reliable, accurate information for our collections. Sometimes that means we're not going to buy that self-pubbed, poorly reviewed title on conversion therapy that that one patron requested because it doesn't fit our collection development policy. Um, we can facilitate access to just about anything without having to spend taxpayer dollars on it. There's ILL. There are collections who do serve as repositories for information like that. Um, but it doesn't mean that we have to buy both sides of every single argument, even if those materials don't exist in a way that fits um, our standards. Um, also, keeping, keeping an eye on things that are going on, Alex Gino, the author of George, is, was the previous title, has requested that we change the title of their book to Melissa's Story. And Alex will send out stickers. I, didn't, I meant to grab them before I started. They're buried in piles over here. But um, Alex sent, an, uh, sent me an envelope, and it's got front cover and spine labels for the copies of Melissa's Story that are here in my library so that I can fix the name um, on those books. Mm -hmm. Very simple, very cheap, makes a huge difference. Okay. I love that. I love that that they were the author themselves was said. You're this is not right. I'm I'm going to facilitate fixing this. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that that was a decision that was made. Um, you know, and and then as soon as it was published, Alex kind of felt like, but that character's name isn't George. Her name is Melissa, and it's mm -hmm. Melissa's story. So I I really love this. Um, yeah, and the new copies of the book will be published with the right title, but I thought it was really neat to be able to go back and, like, I, before I had the stickers, I wrote on mine with a Sharpie, and now I have the pretty sticker to cover it up, but... Um, and that's what they advocated. They, they said, yes, just just change it, yeah. do it. Yes, and yes. now, you know, right at the beginning, and then then they provided, here. here's the stickers to officially do it. Yep, that's the way to do it right, yep. Exactly. I think that I put the link to that on the handout. If I didn't, I will add it um, to that Google Drive file as soon as we're done here. So if you guys have copies of Melissa's story and you want to fix the title, you can fill out that form and Alex will send you an envelope of stickers. Mm -hmm. um, okay, another important thing is cataloging. Most of us in small and rural libraries are doing copy cataloging and we're not creating all the mark records from scratch, but we also aren't part of large systems where there's a lot of red tape and bureaucracy involved in changing what's in our catalog. Like for me, it's as simple as, I mean, it, it's me. I have one employee here and there are two of us for the whole county. So I'm the only one who does the cataloging. So I'm also the only one who can change it. Um, and it's as simple as going in and saying batch edit, searching for an outdated term and replacing it with the more correct, um, compassionate terminology. And Homosaurus is an excellent resource for finding what the current um, most widely accepted compassionate terminology for certain things is and what are some outdated harmful terms that you might want to search your catalog for so that you can replace them. Um, this is from their about page. I like this quote. Homosaurus is designed to serve as a companion to broad subject term vocabularies. Homosaurus is a robust and cutting edge vocabulary of LGBTQ specific terminology that enhances the discoverability of LGBTQ resources. So along with not creating displays that are just LGBTQ books, you have to make sure that they are extremely discoverable through your system. Um, and so this is one way to make sure that, that that's being done correctly and compassionately in a way that's not gonna create any undue harm for your patrons. I would encourage you to adopt a non-discrimination and anti-harassment policy. You can include it as like an addendum to your patron conduct policy or as a standalone policy, um, but it will give you some backup in case you need to ask someone to leave for incendiary or discriminatory language. You have an actual policy, like you cannot stand at my front desk and use those words and here's, here's like the policy that you're violating. Um, 
I have seen a lot of these policies that only speak to the protection of staff members from patron commentary, but I kind of like the ones that are written to protect everyone in the building. Um, something like this can go a long way toward making your space feel and be safer for marginalized people in your community. Um, full disclosure, I do not have one of these policies yet for my own library. I am hoping to get my board to approve one at our next meeting, but my board is a can of worms for another day. Um, when I when I do, the one that I hope to have approved is a combination of these two. These are these are two of my favorites, but I have combined them. So the North Freedom Library one speaks to many specific protected identities: race, color, religion, gender, national origin, age, disability, ancestry, marital status, veteran status, citizenship status, sexual orientation, or any other protected status. Um, the Palace Heights one also calls out sexual harassment in particular, which is a separate issue, um, but I doubt is unfamiliar to any of us that work in public libraries. And I think that there's a there's a potential to sort of create a little umbrella policy here that both um, prevents the sexual harassment of staff and other patrons and also tackles this no discriminatory language allowed in the library kind of thing. Okay. In that LGBTQ and you workshop that I mentioned earlier with um, that I did with Ruth Hyatt. Oh, there is an excellent segment on Arkansas privacy law as it pertains to minors. But since you guys are from all over the country, I did a little digging and I found out that 48 states and Washington, D.C. So everyone but Kentucky and Hawaii have laws on the books um, that protect the privacy of library records. Um, Kentucky and Hawaii have attorney general opinions that support the privacy of library records, but they don't have actual like codified laws about it. I would encourage you to make sure that you are extremely familiar with your state's law as it pertains to library records um, and what you can and cannot share with guardians, even off minor cards. Um, I know when I learned about how this works in the state of Arkansas, there were definitely some surprises for me and I'm really glad to not only know the law, but to know it well enough that I can articulate it to patrons who may not understand why I can't just tell you all the kids that, I mean, all the books that are checked out on your kid's library card just because you asked. You know, there are there are ways around that, but they are very specific. Um, but it gives us a lot, of, a lot of leeway to protecting the privacy of our minor patrons. Okay. Um, this is the part where it's going to get a little darker and I'm not going to dwell on it, but I do want everyone to be aware of all of this because I think awareness is one of our best ways of um, eliminating it. So LGBTQ young people are 120% more likely to experience homelessness than their non-LGBTQ peers. More than one in four kids are kicked out of their house for coming out. One in two get a negative reaction from their families. So um, you can see that that lines up pretty well with that statistic about how many of them have had suicidal thoughts in the past year as well. Now, in, in conjunction with being 120% more likely to experience homelessness, experiencing homelessness makes them 65% uh, or 65% of human trafficking victims reported experiencing homelessness. So they're much more likely to be trafficked if they are experiencing homelessness or housing instability. Um, combined, these numbers show an extremely disproportionate number of LGBTQ young people who are ending up um, as human trafficking victims. Uh, there are two numbers here on the bottom, a text line and a hotline if you suspect that someone might be a victim of human trafficking. In that instance, calling the police may not be the best first line of action. Um, Many marginalized people for many reasons may be uncomfortable with police officers. And so if the goal is actually to get someone help, then these resources might be a better option. Um, often human trafficking is almost impossible to spot in strangers, but that gives us in rural communities a leg up. Context and proximity are keys to being able to see it happening. And we have a lot of context and proximity for our communities. Um, 
in in larger areas the transient nature of people experiencing homelessness can make it more difficult to develop the long-term and deep relationships that we need to be able to spot the changes and the warning signs that come with human trafficking but in rural areas we're a little more well equipped um, to spot it because we don't have as many transient members of our community even you know the the few homeless people here in my community tend to be from here it's um we're, we're geographically distant from many other places so there's not that much transience that occurs um much more common than than being able to see this in one interaction is going to be the sorts of slow personality and behavioral changes that are outlined in the graphic here um, the context of someone's relationship with a child and the proximity of us as librarians to the communities we serve helps us really understand the intricacies of the relationships between people. And that's a quote from the Polaris Project. There are also a lot of barriers to getting help for victims of sex trafficking. The LGBTQ community has historically not had a great relationship with law enforcement. Um, and fear of those interactions may prevent a lot of victims from seeking help and even more from seeking justice. It can also be difficult to admit what's happening, even to your own self or to the people who are very closest to you. And that's before you even consider the inherent danger of trying to escape a trafficking situation. So these are some um, situations that can make people more vulnerable to being trafficked. This is not an exhaustive or complete list, but these are the things that, um, should make you keep it in the back of your mind just you know to be aware of the potential for someone to fall victim to human trafficking okay now we're gonna switch gears back a little bit to um not less important but maybe less immediately distress distressing uh topics so Singles, single stall gendered bathrooms should be all gender bathrooms. The two that you can see behind me here have wooden signs above them that say ladies and gentlemen, and trust me, if I could take those signs off that wall and set them on fire, I would. They were made by the county judge who remodeled this library before I took over, and I have tried, but am not allowed to take them down. Um, that said, I make sure to point out to my patrons that it doesn't matter, they're exactly the same on the inside. So rather than use all gender restroom signs that have um, a man, a woman, and a half man, half woman person, buy signs that have a toilet on them. They're not only clearer and less confusing for uh, gender non-conforming patrons, they're also better for non-English speakers because it's pretty clear what's in that room. It's a toilet. All right. We talked about um, displays, not putting LGBTQ books on a display. That's all LGBTQ books because that functionally puts them out of the reach of children. If you're in a big enough system where you have two or three copies of every book and you can do that and still have a copy on the shelf that's available, that's different. But I can't afford more than one copy of every book. So if I put them on that display, then they are totally out of reach of any kids who cannot have that discussion with the grown-ups in their lives. Um, another thing that is usually much easier to just change without a lot of red tape and headaches and conversations in small libraries, allow your patrons to change the first names on their library cards or their gender, but I don't really see why we need to be collecting gender to begin with. Lone Oak County here in Arkansas recently removed the gender question from their library card signup. We've never asked for it on ours. I don't really see any reason for it. It can create a lot of dysphoria for trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming people, even to like have to answer that question. Um, so if you can do without that, then I would say remove it and oh, just allow them to change their first name. Even if you have to keep a historic record of whatever the name on their driver's license is, um, it's, it's a small thing to allow someone to go by their chosen name. Um, or their true name rather than be called something that does not feel like it belongs to them. And bonus, affirming transgender and non-binary youth, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say people, 
by respecting pronouns and allowing them to change legal documents, which your library card is uh, a legal document. It's associated with lower rates of attempting suicide. So respecting the pronouns of the people around us is a really simple way that you can have a huge positive effect on, on your patrons and your community. Um, it stands to reason to me that having an outside adult authority figure respect the pronouns um, is also gonna have a positive effect on mental health. You can see here, this is legal documents, but this next slide is gonna show the effect, here it is. If you live with other people, how many of them respect your pronouns? And then across that, what are the suicide attempt rates? So you can see that as the number of people in a household who respect someone's pronouns goes up, the rate of suicide attempts goes down pretty directly. I mean, that that's a huge correlation there. So um, it's a really small thing to allow your patrons to tell you what pronouns they prefer and use those pronouns. But we, I think we get really used to kind of making those assumptions and we don't even realize when we're gendering our patrons um, sort of like automatically. So paying attention to it can be huge. And you may never even know the kind of effect that you've had on someone by not misgendering them. Um, so that to me is all the more reason to make sure that we're really careful about not making that mistake. Absolutely, and it's, it's just a small thing. And I am thrilled so much that we have this data, actual studies, I mean, yeah, it's so all common, of this is from to me. It's common sense that this would be the effect and the the things that are happening, but having the data to show to people who are maybe unsure or don't understand or don't believe is huge. well, and and having it to share with your stakeholders. So yeah, exactly. if you have a patron who comes in who says, "Why do, why are you putting this on my library card sign up?" or a board member who says. What are we hurting by asking for gender on our library card signups? You could show them this data. You can mm -hmm. say, look, here's what's going on. All I want to do is keep my patrons safe mm -hmm. from, from all of the things that I can possibly keep them safe from. Mm -hmm. So it's a little thing. It's a little thing and it makes a huge difference. This data is all from the Trevor Project's 20, I think it was 2020. Um, mm -hmm report and that is definitely linked on the handout and this is just like one little bit of it that I pulled out to use for this presentation but there is an unbelievably huge amount of really great data in that report so I would encourage you to go read the whole thing and we have someone who commented and this I think is is great that their ILS I don't know which one it is maybe they can share that has actually two entries to put in there for a person and it says um for their name legal and preferred there are two yeah. actual fields for that so that is so the ILSs are actually taking on that's being, awesome doing this yeah and it, it in so many ways it's nothing new I mean my my name on my driver's license is Allison but I barely even respond to that if someone called me that because I don't go by Allison I go by Allie who is, who is that how many, yeah how many friends do I have that are named Catherine but they go by Kate or Katie and it's it's mm -hmm. exactly the same procedure you know it's not you would never say, well, you can't put Kate on your library card. You have to put Catherine. Like, who cares? This I am who I am. Yeah. Autographics right, right. versus autographics verso is the ILS. And someone else is awesome. there's also Atrium Book Systems does it as well. So it's the you know, other it. doing yeah. that. So like it's not even any extra work for you to no. put in their it's preferred in there. name. Yep. Yeah. It's already there. Um Okay, like I mentioned with cataloging, terminology changes. When I was first in introduced to the pronoun conversation, when I was probably back in college, the way that it was referred to then was your preferred pronouns. But more recently, that has stopped. It's, we don't call it preferred pronouns anymore. We call it personal pronouns because they're not just preferred pronouns. Like, it's, I don't just prefer to go by my name. That is my name. Um, same thing with pronouns. So. Uh, be aware, I would say, of changing language. Um, not that any of us have time to do more than we're already doing, but if you 
keep an eye to these kinds of conversations, then you'll start to notice when things are called something else. And if you are still, like if your library card says preferred pronouns, maybe make it say personal pronouns. Um, little stuff, but it's just, it shows um, patrons that we are paying attention to what is least harmful. Um, Y'all is probably my favorite word in the English language. When I have groups of students, I always say y'all. I try to never say ladies and gentlemen or boys and girls. Um, y'all is versatile, inoffensive, culturally unique, and completely agender. Um, another evergreen reminder that I will talk about probably until I die is don't call programs things like mommy and me or daddy and daughter hairstyle day. It's very easy to call it something else. And not only are you not ostracizing your um, LGBTQ kids, you're also allowing for participation more comfortably for kids who don't have a mom or don't have a dad who live with their grandparents or, you know, maybe uh, like my son has long hair. Maybe his dad wants to bring him and learn how to braid his hair. You know, so it's very simple to not gender your programs that way. Um, and it's, it serves to benefit a lot of our patrons for various reasons. So no genders in the library. Using the terminology words there in the, your middle bullet is something that I know I have personally struck, um, I don't know if I say struggled with, but I'm making a personal concerted effort to not use things like, so you guys all know, blah, 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 blah. Because it's something okay. I, I noticed myself that's saying it, and, and it, 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 yeah, and with everything that's happening, and it just made me, it, it, it graded on myself. So I actually um, have a note to myself on my because I do a lot of online sessions, a lot of online presentations. I have a note to myself that says because I apparently use the word guys as just like a general. So you guys know blah blah blah, and it says guys. It has a big why. red circle and line through it so that I remind myself I used a red man don't use that word and I like you all and um because it is it's just or all of you and yeah. so I, it's it's something it's that I've had to really strongly stop doing and I'm trying and I think I'm doing and I think it's it's like it's one of those things like accidentally using the wrong pronouns for someone mm -hmm. it is it is not malicious it <laughs> is um habitual it is instinctual it is a reflex and it takes time to learn to not have that reflex yep. so if you mess up Another best thing to do is says, just yeah and it and, I, and if i do it wrong i don't make a big deal out of it but i just i fix it right away like if i hear right. oh whoops yeah. i said it i'll just say you guys all of you know you know i'll just yeah exactly okay. you don't have the, to more, the more you do it the more you practice it the easier it gets. yeah all right, so the uh, most important thing about sharing resources with your patrons is to make sure that you're providing those resources in such a way that patrons can see them in multiple formats and locations. Um, make posters, bookmarks, bathroom signs, put your graphic online, hang it up in multiple locations, put it, um, you know, like it, not so much because it will be more visible, but because it will be more accessible. So a kid who can't pick up an LGBTQ reading list bookmark off the front desk while their uh, parent is standing right next to them can look at the sign in the bathroom and know which books they might be looking for without having to identify why they're looking for those books. Um, so just always be thinking about all the different ways that you can share this information. Um, don't just include crisis resources either. Either, um, Not that crisis resources aren't important, but there's a lot of non-crisis events. Like the Equality Crew in Northwest Arkansas does these really great social events. Like they have, um, I don't remember what they called it. I think it was, it was either Pride Prom or Queer Prom or something like that. But it was basically like prom for high schoolers facilitated by this nonprofit organization. Um, and it was, it was a fun event. It was a joyous celebration. Uh, so don't, only think about the things that people might need in bad situations, but also try and share the good stuff. Fun organizations. Um, let's see. So in 
altering this presentation for a national audience instead of an Arkansas specific audience, I thought about what I was going to do about the resources. So if you look here, Intransitive, Lucy's Place, Arkansas Law Help, and the Arkansas Crisis Center are kind of specific to our state. Intransitive is a shelter in, uh, well, not just a shelter, it's a huge organization in Little Rock that's doing a lot of really great stuff. And then Lucy's Place is um, a shelter and Arkansas Law Help has our kinds of documentation. But what I thought was I would keep them in there in the hopes that it will encourage you to seek out similar resources in your state. Um, let's see these in particular so free mom hugs has a chapter in every state i think arkansas children's hospital has a gender spectrum clinic that's amazing and the children's hospital in your state might also have one um trans families is national gender spectrum is national p flag is national nwa equality and the equality crew are both in northwest arkansas but they are like um private nonprofit organizations who are doing like Equality Crew is the one who does the the prom thing and they do like a monthly it's not bingo night but it's kind of like a game night or something for um, LGBTQ young people like just fun opportunities to get together with other like-minded kids um, that don't have to be stressful that they can just be and enjoy themselves so I ended up leaving the Arkansas resources in so that you can look for similar things um, in your area Okay, these are ways to check yourself. Project Implicit comes from Harvard and that is a way to do implicit bias testing online. Um, I will warn you that the results might shock you. So go into this with a very open mind and be prepared for the fact that they may be able to detect bias that you were not aware of. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's wrong. So there, there may be a little discomfort to sit in for some of us through those project implicit bias tests. Learning for Justice used to be teaching tolerance. It's done by the Southern Poverty Law Center and they have the school climate assessment, um, which like I said, is not wholly unapplicable to a public library climate. The Guide to Allyship is a really quick, like blog roll scroll page and it's, um, do's and don'ts and checklists for how to be a good ally. It is applicable to allyship, not just for LGBTQ patrons, but also for patrons of color. Um, and I think that there's a lot of like little chunks of information that are really useful in there. And I would encourage you to read it. It's a fast one. It's not like, um, you know, a long workshop or a half day or anything like that. It's very short. The safe space training is one that our um, state public library coordinator put on my radar last week, and it is workshops for um, how to ensure that you really are offering a safe space to your patrons. Uh, we talk, I talked about this a little bit earlier. Filtering softwares often erroneously block harmless or helpful LGBTQ resources. Um, use the resource list in the handout from one of your public computers signed in as a patron and see if you can get to all those websites. And because I promise there is nothing on that that's even remotely inappropriate and there are a lot of resources that your patrons may need to be able to access. So you're gonna wanna make sure that those things can all get through your filter without someone having to come and ask you about it um, in the interest of you know, privacy. Okay, uh, being prepared for the more and more likely inevitable challenges to programs and uh, materials. So you can create support documentation for titles that you think are likely to be challenged. It's not okay to not buy things because they might create a challenge, but you can be aware of which things might create that issue and go ahead and start practicing the creation of the support documentation or just keep a little folder. Um, starred reviews from trade publications, specific sections of your collection development policy that support inclusion of that title. Like um, I chose it from this vendor. It had this many reviews. It has this rating on Goodreads. It was on this book list and this book list. And those are all things that should be outlined in your collection development policy as reasons that a book is appropriate for your collection. Um, 
another thing that I really love are sticky note reviews. If you just put like a blank sticky note in a book and ask people who read it to jot down their thoughts, then you have a totally non-identifiable but very real anecdotal piece of evidence that the books that you've selected are helpful and loved by your community. Um, I would also encourage you to distill your policy down to one or two sentences. So if someone comes in and they say, um, this is not an LGBTQ book, but it is a Roe v. Wade book. So also maybe one that would get challenged. They say, you have this book and I don't think you should have this book and I want you to take it off the shelf. You should have a very simple, straightforward statement that's something like, um, I appreciate you taking an interest in the books that are in our library. The here's a copy of our reconsideration form or maybe, you know, maybe better not to mention the form and say we have this form that's available um, and outline what they have to do. Just read the whole book and mark the parts they disagree with and why. And then what are they going to do with it? Do they bring it back to you? Do they send it to the board? But that's it. Never try to defend a book on the spot. Doesn't matter. They don't care why you selected that book. They don't think you should have. Um, but the more you like, for me at least, you know, there there are two of us, and I'm the only one who's selecting and buying books. So every book that's in this library was hand selected by me specifically for this library. So having someone come in and challenge those decisions is um, emotionally impactful because I chose those materials with the best interest of my community in mind. Um, so it, it's it's hard to, ha to have someone come at you and tell you that what you're doing is hurting your community. So the more prepared you are for that, the more you can rattle off that statement in a very calm, cool, and professional way that you don't have to react with anger. You don't have to react with the justification for why you bought that book, which for me is so hard sometimes because I've definitely had parents who were like, this book is totally inappropriate for my teenager. And I wanna be like, but there's this and this and this and this. They don't care. And you're only going to end up getting uh, into a more dramatic situation than it needs to be. So get somebody to help you practice that response. Practice it over and over and over. And this is the, the last thing that I'm really going to talk about. And this is what um, I mentioned earlier. So I saw recommendations for parents of trans kids in state like states like Texas to create these safe folders for their families. We're obviously going to have different types of documentation, but I think it's a good idea for us to collect a safe folder for our organizations or for ourselves as librarians. So I have photos, videos, drawings, letters. I have all of these things from young people over the years or from patrons. Um, I have copies of applicable library laws and policies for my library. I have certificates from trainings and courses that I've done. I've now done, this is the third time I've done this um, presentation. So I can put all these things together and then if someone comes in and they say, well, you know, what are you doing? You're creating this harm for my child who I don't want to be exposed to this. And then it ends up at the board. Then I have this folder that's full of documentation, actual hard evidence that what I'm doing is appreciated by the community that I am following the law and I am following the library policy and that I am trained and continually developing my skill at these things. Um, so anyway, the, the closer all of this gets to home for all of us, the more I think it's probably a good idea to have a way to support ourselves like this. All right, this is a list from the Polaris Project and it shows 10 actions that organizations can take to support the LGBTQ people. And this one is for employers. Um, a couple of these are specific to human trafficking because that's what the Polaris project focuses on. But for the most part, I think this is a pretty good starting place for evaluating your own organization. So are you training staff on how to create a welcoming space? Or are you training yourself on how to create welcoming spaces? Are you um, revisiting confidentiality practices and allowing for flexibility in uh, library card signups? So these are some high level things to think about and maybe come up with some ways that you can shift things um, to have more inclusive libraries. Okay, I wanna end on a good note. So 
this is a graphic from the Trevor Project that shows hundreds, or well, the original um, was hundreds of ways, but this is the, the most common ways that LGBTQ young people say that they find joy and strength. And I would just like to invite you to look at how many of these things libraries can and are already providing. We can't do much about making sure they have affirming parents, but we can provide access to anime, art and creative expression, connection to other LGBTQ people, educational opportunities, escape through reading and writing, feeling seen, online communities, space to be with people, um, LGBTQ history, online chat groups, media representation, connection to music, rainbow flags and stickers, pride from others in being LGBTQ. Um, we can help them embrace their full selves. Some of us even can provide video game access and access to TikTok and YouTube. So um, I, I don't want you to feel like you have to do absolutely everything or that this is all a thing that needs to happen overnight. I think as long as we're all making uh, integral steps in the right direction, we're gonna have a huge positive effect and our existence and our making sure that we are obviously inclusive, safe spaces goes a long way um, toward making the LGBTQ members of our communities feel and be safer. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all. I went a little bit over time. I'm sorry about that. No. No, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> um, absolutely. I agree. Agree and um, entirely. Um, well, oh, actually, you can keep your slides up there if you want to keep your slide okay. and your contact info up. Yeah, go ahead and reshare that. Um, does anybody, um, we do have a few questions I'm going to grab here. Um, so um, if I, we don't get to your questions, you can always reach out to Allie there as well. Um, so thank you. this was, as people are saying, a terrific um, presentation. Um, and I, I agree with someone else who said this, really appreciate your passion on this topic um, and all of the great practical tools that you have are providing to everyone. As I said, there was a link um, to a Google Drive that I shared out to everyone and it will be included in the recordings and we have it afterwards just so um, you all know. Um, da -da -da. So we do have a question about um, going back to the very beginning. You had that um, the Homosource resource. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you, can you share any of the terminology that you found that you changed from using that? Um, I would have to go back and look at it. I don't know. It's been a long time since I actually <laughs> looked at my catalog to see. Um, there are specifically some words that used to be used to describe transgender people mm -hmm. that are no longer the appropriate terminology. Um, I don't know, I think I've kind of stricken some of the bad old ones from my memory on purpose. <laughs> nothing nothing is coming to mind right now. No problem. Um, Another good question I have here. Um, you mentioned not creating specialized book lists, gendered, but then talked about sharing resources um, about um, LGBTQ items. Um, how and when do you use the specialized resources? Like, this, what would be a good situation to actually, or how have you actually used them? What do you mean, like? The the resources well, themselves. The resources or the, the yeah, well, for the for the um that you put together, you know, that you mentioned that may be helpful to anyone coming to our library who's, you know, dealing with this. Uh, we keep, um, we keep a list of resources at the front and I shared, like the slide that I shared that has all those links in it has all the ones that we, I didn't share the links, but I had, it has like the little images of the logos. Um, we have like a flyer that has, you know, questions or need help and it has all of those different organizations listed on it. All right she's actually saying specifically about book lists you said not creating specialized book lists but you talk about sharing resources like would there be a situation to actually like have a book list I mean would that be like during you know LGBTQ month or I don't know. I also like I mean I, I include those books in every genre resource that I create I make certain that there are um, a mix mm -hmm. of LGBTQ books in, you know, like uh, my Black History Month posts had some LGBTQ titles mixed in and with everything else. I don't separate them out in any specific way. Um, 
during June, I will do like an LGBTQ specific uh, reading list on the Facebook page or something like that. But otherwise, I'm not really separating them out. You know, I, I think as long as the materials themselves are discoverable, um, people will find what it is that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And you did mention actually at the beginning, and this is someone else is asking about that I think relates to this, that not putting out like in June, this is like I said, I love doing, I want to normalize the conversation about these issues. So I love making a great big display in June. But since we don't have multiple copies of anything, you mentioned put, putting signs out that talk about them, but not the actual books, leave the books on the shelves. Is That would be something like this too? Or like yeah, a display well, like, that just, yeah. I have one of those cheap laminators, like yeah, those lamin eight and a half by 11. And so you can do a half page of the book cover and then laminate it, stick it to a book thing and put that on the table so that it still looks like, you know, this display, it's got all the pretty titles and all that kind of stuff. But the books themselves are still on the shelf. And yeah, so it'll I'll, have, you know. Yeah, anybody remember um, going to Blockbuster Video? <laughs> exactly. A long, long time yeah. ago. Like the, the, DVDs, the, DVD case. The, the movies were out there. Right. It was a fake case. Yeah. yeah a dummy <laughs> case. <laughs> same, same concept. Except instead of to keep them from getting stolen, it's to make them still be available. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this may not, like, that may not be um, on the radar in every community. I think there are a lot of communities in different places around the country where it's probably more accepted you know, for a kid with a grown up to walk in and pick up a book like that, but not here. Awesome. And it's very, yeah. Yeah. And so I, I have seen a lot of libraries do it. And in a way to me, sometimes it kind of seems like virtue signaling on the part of the library rather than true mm -hmm. access concern for the patrons. So I want to signal to the community that we are open to these things, but not at the expense of this kid really wants to read that book and cannot go grab it off of that table because of the adult that is with them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to come at it from a, from a position of access rather than a position of um, like marketing or how does this look for the library? Absolutely. Now in, in that link that you shared with, um, with us, um, there's, the slides are in there. There's a handout. There's you mentioned there are book lists as well, too, correct? Yes, there are three. There's picture books, middle grade, and teen. And the middle grade and teen ones both have um there wasn't a lot of nonfiction the past couple of years, but they both do have graphic they have at least one nonfiction and they have graphic novels and um titles. It's just the covers. So if for some reason you can't find one of the books or you need more information about it, you can send me an email and I'm happy to help you out. Yeah, and I sent, I shared, I should have shared it out again to everyone. Whoops. Uh, and... I can send the Canva files to anybody too, if you want to take those and change them to match like what you have in your collection or mm -hmm. um, put your library logo on it or whatever. I mean, it's a Canva template. I'm not, it's not my copyright. I'm not attached to it. Um, and so one last question, because I, I, I was liking this as well. Um, and like I said, anyone else has any questions, you can reach out to Allie and everything will be available later. Um, the sticky note idea, I love that as too, as, as an idea, you know, people coming in saying, I don't think this should be here. My child should be seeing this. And since I'm one of your users, I'm telling you to get rid of it. Well, there are other users of the library too. You're not the only one. Um, so I love that sticky note idea saying, well, here is actually some other community member who did like this book. So you can see that there's other people with other opinions. Um, but how do you encourage someone to do one of those without drawing attention to what, you know, I assume it's like an anonymous type thing. How do you get someone to write one of these without risking themselves by putting themselves out there with this comment or review? <laughs> I think that's just kind of like an individual thing. Like if it's too risky, don't do it. I don't want them to do it for my benefit if it's not safe for them. Um, but it is kind of hidden in the book. So if they have just a second, they can jot it down and close the book. And once it comes through our book drop up there, no one sees it, no one touches it, but us. And the sticky note will get removed, go into a folder and then be permanently divorced from whatever circulation history or whoever, you know what I mean? When the book gets checked wow. back in, awesome. you would never know that it had been there. So it's just make it totally anonymous so that people, yeah. And it's just, no, this is somebody put this in here. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I have, I mean, I have patrons who leave like all the time. We get books back in the book drop and it's got like, you know, a half torn piece of paper that so-and-so is like, Jamie, I love you this book. sometimes. Yeah, that's pick, true. Pick me more like this, Miss Watson. That's my board president who was my second grade teacher because that's the kind of town I live in. Um, so like getting notes back in books is already something that we're watching out for in every book we get because it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, I think we will wrap up here. We're at noon, so we do have to move on to our lightning round sessions. Thank you so much, Ellie. This was a great presentation. Um, thank you so you much a, for thank you. Yeah, and a, a, even more personally, as someone is saying here, thank you from the parent of a trans daughter for all that you are doing. Ah, yeah. thank you. Please let me know. I'm, I'm happy to do anything, anytime. Absolutely. If there's anything else I can help with. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. We are going to jump right into 